We are biological machines, and none of it are things you had control over. Max Tagmark, who has calculated that for a quantal event to influence the oscillation of a single molecule in a neuron, it takes 23 orders of magnitude going up. That is how you create random behavior. And throughout history, we have found points where we have figured out, oh, there's actually no free will there. It's not their fault. Each time the world becomes better. We are biological machines. We're biological machines that are incredibly complicated, but we are biological machines. And all we are is the outcome of our biological history over which we had no control and its interactions with environment over which we had no control and put those pieces together. And that is how you become who you are in this moment with the values you have, with the intentions, with the wishes, with the whatevers, this is what made you you. And none of it are things you had control over. What makes that we are humans, uh, if not free will? Lots of other things. We are biological machines who could know that we are biological machines. We are primates who know we are going to die someday. We are mammals who are capable of feeling the pain of someone on the other side of the planet, where, you know, all of those are ways in which we are animals, but very, very peculiar animals. Maybe free will, it's determined by the quantum house inside a human brain. That's also the question how the human consciousness is born. This is, this is a very attractive, a very tempting model to go for quantum indeterminacy because at least I take it about 70, 80% of physicists um, agree that at the subatomic level, there is no determinism. There is no causality. Um, there is no arrow of time that, yeah, it's really like that down there. But the question becomes, is the indeterminacy at the quantal subatomic level able to come up enough levels to influence the function of one neuron? And there's a good mathematician at MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a mathematician named Max Tagmark, who has calculated that for a quantal event to influence the oscillation of a single molecule in a neuron, it takes 23 orders of magnitude going up. 23, one followed by 23 zeros. That's how unlikely that is to happen. And for that to occur, to actually affect behavior, all of these quantal events would have to come up and synchronize and do that all at the same time. So it is mathematically impossible. The second issue is, even if it was possible for subatomic quantal events to bubble all the way up and influence behavior, influence the workings of whole sections of our brain, that is how you create random behavior. And we're not interested in random behavior. We don't think free will is random. Um, free will, when we think about it, it's that moral compass that you have shown since you were five years old and as a 90-year-old in the continuity. All that quantum indeterminacy would do if somehow it did come up that far is make our behavior totally random and incoherent. The final problem is a lot of people who do argue for pulling free will out of quantum mechanics, at that point they say, okay, okay, once you have this higher level of functioning, you got a brain, you got consciousness, you got a whole organism, whatever, it is possible to harness quantal indeterminacy to in effect reach down those 23 orders of magnitude, whatever, and somehow use quantal indeterminacy to produce the behavior that you wish, to exercise your agency. And when you look at the science of the people who propose that, and some of them are completely 
you know, charlatan scientists, but some of them, at least one of them is a Nobel laureate in physics who argues for quantal basis of free will. Um, when you look at the neurobiology that they have to imagine for us to be able to reach down and harness quantal events, the science is incoherent. Um, it's children's stories. It doesn't work that way. We don't have the means to reach down and make quantal events work differently in a way that will give us more power to resist temptation. If quantal events, even without that, bubbled all the way up, it would be describing completely random behavior. Quantal indeterminacy is like the most amazing thing imaginable. It has nothing to do with how one neuron functions, let alone 80 billion of them in us. It's just a different scale. Today, we, we know also that the butterfly effect works fully different in a classical world and in a quantum world. And that's wonderful. And that's very important for arguments about free will, because you tell someone, try to convince them there's no free will, and they say, oh, are you saying that like two minutes after the Big Bang, already the entire future was already determined? That if you could have sat there then and known where every single subatomic molecule was in the universe, you could have figured out what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow, or if you're going to sneeze in 27 and a half minutes, or that, oh, everything was already set. And the future is not already set. There are, in fact, multiple possible futures. Why is that? Because of butterfly effects, because of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, because of exactly that sort of thing. What that means is there are all sorts of things that are never, ever possible to be predicted at a certain level of accuracy. And it's not just a matter of, ooh, if we just got better instruments for measuring stuff, what chaoticism proves is there are some things that will never, ever be predictable at a certain level of resolution. But that is a world different from not predictable is not the same as not determined. It's still made of the same stuff, but because butterfly effects can happen 4,000 decimal places out at this end, it simply means it's never predictable. You cannot predict the future at this point, um, but once it occurs, it will have been a deterministic phenomenon. Unpredictable is not the same thing as undetermined, and that's why chaoticism, even though it's like the most interesting thing in the universe, tells us nothing about the free will problem. What is the relation between the free will and consciousness, the human consciousness? I do not think there is a relationship. People who believe in free will uh, tend to believe that actions that we take that are conscious, that's where you're seeing free will in action. Um, in my view, insofar as there is no free will, whether we are acting consciously or unconsciously, it's the same underlying mechanisms of biology. Um, you know, we behave, fish behave, we turned out to have the sort of nervous systems that can produce consciousness, fish don't have it. Nonetheless, it's the same sort of machine in action when behavior is being produced by either. Uh, do you think that the humanity will ever accept your conception that we have no free will? Well, I think it is very unlikely that uh, people will ever be able to do that um, because I've been thinking this way since I was a teenager and I cannot behave this way most of the time. Most of the time, I behave as if there is free will, as if judgments make sense, as if a sense of worth or entitlement or deservedness makes sense. And then I have to stop myself and say, wait a second, that, that doesn't actually make sense or so. It's, it's unimaginable how we are supposed to do that. Yet, we've done it over and over and over again throughout history. We used to think that people who we called witches were able to control the weather. 
And thus, if there was a horrible storm that destroyed the crops, go burn the old woman at the stake. And then we figured out, oh, that is not something that people have control over. That is not an area in which they are freely acting agents. And we figured that out. And the world didn't collapse when we decided that thunderstorms are not caused by old women casting spells. And it's a much nicer planet. And then we figured out that people who have epileptic seizures are not sleeping with Satan. They're not demonically possessed. We figured out, oh, it's a neurological disorder. So don't don't burn them at the stake or that's it's just like a, it's like diabetes it's like hiccups it's like it's a biological problem and we could now have people drive vehicles who have epilepsy and they have to go a certain number of months on their medication without a seizure to be able to drive we can keep the world safe from the notion that people with epilepsy are going to cause car accidents or people with epilepsy are sleeping with Satan. We've been able to subtract those out and the world keeps functioning and it's a much better world. We figured out that there are some neurodevelopmental problems in kids uh, that we now call dyslexia. And this is a kid who's going to have a lot of trouble learning to read, not because they're stupid, not because they're unmotivated, but they do something. They flip letters over in their brain. Their brain flips them and they have trouble being able to keep that straight. And when I was a kid, at least, um, someone who we would now say has dyslexia, when I was a kid, anyone in charge would say they are stupid and they are lazy. And that's why they're not. And they're going to grow up thinking of themselves as stupid and lazy. And in the last 40 years, we figured out, oh, that's another realm where the kid isn't sitting there saying, ooh, I don't feel like trying to learn how to read. Their brain can't do it this way. You have to find a different way to teach them. And we figured out there's no free will involved in that. And not only are we, as a result, better at teaching kids uh, how to read, but we don't train people to grow up thinking that they are lazy and terrible people because they've got a funny thing in this part of their cortex so that they flip letters over. Over and over again throughout history, we have found points where we have figured out, oh, there's actually no free will there. It's not their fault. And each time the world becomes better. Um, so we may not be able to like get everyone to sign up and believe this, um, but you know, slowly, slowly, people used to think that, I don't know, some people just because of who they are, they are meant to be slaves. They they cannot take care of themselves. 400 years ago, probably most people living in the Enlightenment in Western Europe would have said, yeah, you know, some people, slavery, that's okay. In fact, you're doing them a favor. Ooh, people changed. And now we realize that is not intuitively correct, that it is okay for some people to be slaves. It is not intuitively correct that seven-year-old children should work to death in factories. It's not intuitively correct anymore that a child who has trouble learning how to read in a certain way, that it's because there's something screwy with their brain structure, not because they're lazy. With each one of these, we shift to a new level of understanding how things work and things get better with each one of these.